Um, James has been um, in our department for three semesters. One as a guest, two as a pro. <laughs> and he is an independent graphic designer writer based in Birmingham, UK. Welcome. Um, he often works in close collaboration with contemporary artists and represents their work through graphic design like Celine Condorelli, Sophia Hülten, Kelly Spooner, Uta Eisenreich. He is also one of the six founding directors of the Artist Run Gallery Eastside project in Birmingham and is also involved in exhibitions such as Book Show, um, which was exploring the ideas of Mexican artist book publisher Ulysses Carrion and also um, exhibitions with artists like Jennifer T, Mike Nelson, Karl Navrot, and you are also doing the graphic design for these projects, right? Yeah. And also, you are also involved in a spatial sort of structure of things. Sometimes. Yeah. And he's currently um, working on a... Can I, can I tell them that you're doing a PhD on Norman Potter? No. <laughs> <laughs> so he's working on a multimedia biography of English, English designer Norman Potter as a teacher who was a 20th century British designer. Today he's going to show us his own works, also in relation to other works by other people, art and design. And he's going to do it through an isomorphic reading, which is, oh, now I'm seeing the people in the back. Thanks for coming. <laughs> Welcome to Havke. Um, uh, isomorphism is a general concept that appears in several areas of mathematics. Iso means equal, and morphosis means to form or to shape. This is all I can tell you about it, that's why I'm just going to take over. And um, coming full circle, um, Norman Potter was the first person writing about isomorphism, and that's where James discovered the concept also. In relation to design. In relation to design. Yeah. That's it for me, and welcome James. Take the stage. Good evening, everyone. Uh, yeah, so I used this word isomorphism in my title. Really, the whole lecture will be the explanation of what, what that might mean in relation to design. But I thought we should begin with something quite uh, short and speculative. Does anyone, is there any observation about this picture? Anything that you noticed when you came into the room? Does the form remind you of anything? I, some, I really, someone did actually just whisper the answer. Australia. Australia, thank you so much. Yeah, so this, I, I found this image earlier this year, uh, completely by chance. It's a photograph taken by a tourist on a beach in Darwin, in Australia. Um, And this is a local newspaper or um, online news article about it. Kelly Matthews is the photographer. The line that really excited me when I saw this is near the bottom. I've visited every state and territory in Australia now, so it's like the map is complete. It's perfect, she said. I just love taking photos. <laughs> What I find completely extraordinary about this is, is the idea that this is obviously not, not a design gesture, it's completely by chance that she took this image, but it contains this idea of a kind of fractal logic that, that her picture is taken in Australia and in this completely uh, chance respect also somehow represents all of Australia in this moment when she happened to have finished her travels around Australia. So I think that might be isomorphic, at least in the way that I'm using the term, and I'll, I'll certainly go further into what it means. I feel like I should just give a short introduction to the origins of my practice. I first trained as a designer, um, but I came to graphic design uh, about 15 years ago, and in the, in the beginning of my practice, I was making work like this. Um, very straightforward uh, 
art catalogues representing works of contemporary artists where the the design language was somehow quite equivalent with the curatorial language of the exhibitions that these books accompanied. So typically um, following this kind of code of quite minimal um, representations of artworks with a lot of white space where that white space is somehow um, in parallel to the white walls of the gallery. <coughs> I'm doing this on an iPad and it's completely impossible to go backwards, so... But then over the, the, the time that I've been working, I've gradually started to um, make closer collaborations with artists and try to somehow with them share the decision-making process about the kinds of publishing that, that, that they'll be represented by. For example, this is really recent, uh, done last year in collaboration with Uta Eisenreich. It's uh, quite, quite an indirect representation of a piece of her work uh, that was that existed as a uh, a staging of a uh, Gertrude Stein play uh, produced with a kind of feedback between ob objects being uh, manipulated on a table and a projection screen showing stylized live views of those manipulations. Um, all things that felt rather impossible to translate into the form of a book. Hence us together arriving at this completely tangential graphic language, um, something that visually hardly resembles the work that it represents, but um, takes its license to do that from, from the idea of this very close negotiation with the artist. <coughs> And then other, this is really recent stuff made for Celine Condorelli. This slide and the next one, I just include them to say that uh, I see this kind of development from those first few books that I showed you that are very detached somehow in their graphic moves. They really abstain from any kind of um, reflective gesture in relation to what's being represented. To other works that really are made by me as a designer for artists as artworks. So I have, a, I have this working relationship with Celine Condorelli where um, I make, I realise as a graphic designer works of hers that she exhibits in exhibitions. And the, our, our collaboration and our negotiation about the authorship of those works is quite precisely defined, where they're intellectually her works, but graphically realised by me. This was just done for a solo show that she did at P! Exclamation in New York. Uh, the, the graphic uh, language that it uses is is something that I'm going to go more into right now in the context of this place. This is Eastside Projects um, in the centre of the image with the billboard. This is Birmingham. Uh, Eastside Projects was founded in 2008 by six of us, five artists, one architect and me a designer, that makes seven, uh, four artists one architect and me. Uh, the, the curatorial proposition of the space has two main aspects to it. The first is that uh, there's some idea of um, usable artworks or artworks that exist in multiple iterations. This is a sculpture by Heather and Ivan Morrison that was installed in the first show that we did in this gallery and then thereafter was used by us as the gallery office. So we would sit inside the structure and we, we worked in it for uh, 
actually about five years until it gradually lowered to the extent that it was actually quite impossible to move around inside without catching your head. This picture is just here to show you the, the dimensions of this space. Birmingham's kind of a post-industrial city uh, with lots, with an abundance of this kind of um, warehouse space. The building used to be a cabinet maker's workshop. Now the other aspect of the curatorial program that I think is important and is ultimately going to lead towards defining this idea of isomorphism, I'm going to explain it using some kind of structural logic of a printing press. So this is a picture of uh, a view of an exhibition in the gallery in 2011 and um, what it represents to me is this uh, second curatorial idea of how things should evolve over time. So here's the same picture, just the Siam channel, if you understand the separation of the image into four channels that represent the modules of a CMYK printing press. And the way the exhibition proceeded is uh, it didn't have a fixed form, so aspects of its installation and um, the artists whose work was being exhibited changed during the course of the exhibition. So this is the magenta channel from the same position into this exhibition, but a period of time later. And here are the two together. Some interesting effect that starts to be produced is the idea that time starts to be registered. In the area on the right where there's hardly any ink in either of those first two images because they're both showing a white wall, the image starts to resolve into a colour picture. But in the left area where there was first a white wall, meaning not very much ink coverage, now that wall is removed and the detail of what's behind it emerges, appears into that unprinted space. <coughs> Later again, the structure is reconfigured for a performance and combined. And finally, a view of that performance. And here, here the four together. Um, so that proposition, the idea that things in that space are allowed to accumulate over time is uh, really came from Gavin Wade. He's one of the other six directors and um, has been for me just quite a profound influence on the way that I think about the relationship between um, a thing that's being represented and the kinds of moves that you might make as a graphic designer to exemplify that thing in your translation of it. I'll show you quickly some of the graphic design work that has been done for that programme. These are announcements for the same exhibition happening in 2011. The economics of how this proceeds is we bought a really large volume of paper I think maybe 10,000 sheets of paper, printed that invitation announcement on all of them, but only distributed 1,000 to our mailing list. And we kept the rest, the other 9,000, in this print shop that we were regularly using. And we then understood that stock of paper as somehow the material body that we would continue to use to represent this changing exhibition. So every time we had a new announcement to make, we would literally print it over the top of the uh, already printed sheets. And that would proceed like this in a kind of improvised way, where it's not determined in advance how, what the new content will be and how it will appear on the sheet.
This thing on the left is um, an envelope made from the paper left over in that previous process at the end of the exhibition. So it was um, manufactured into an envelope and the size of, of envelope that could be produced from that format uh, determined the format of these announcements for the programme that followed. <coughs> and then they too were successively overprinted to announce new exhibitions. So you understand the idea that um, a, an attempt to think graphically in parallel with this accumulation of material happening in the gallery. On the left, letter-headed paper, which was then used following the same logic for a period of time to announce exhibitions. This one is somehow quite hard to define, but this second printing has a, a, a very soft coverage of pale green ink. It just leaves unprinted the exact shapes of the letters that are beneath. You can see it's very slightly misregistered, the word Ashantra is still visible there. And then this, the same logic, printing green into all the spaces that were previously not green to create a new, uh, new field of colour that something darker, typographic, can be legible on. And then this is quite, quite a good moment in the development of that. We worked in 2013 with Mike Nelson, a British sculptor, and he hated everything about, everything that I've just described to you, he hated and found it that really sort of offended his sensibility as an artist. Um, he's someone who makes his own reaction to the frame of a white cube gallery and finds it disturbing that, that someone else should already be anticipating and um, changing the conditions. So he wanted to, to completely remake the gallery. His practice anyway is extremely manual and that's him on the left. He's poured this concrete floor over the top of the existing floor because various um, artworks had been made on that floor and, and remained visible. So he wants to obscure them and he's built these temporary walls that he's going to paint white. So in the moment that that was happening, onto this, ac this uh, accumulated coverage of ink on the announcement, we just silk screened this white section, trying to imitate that gesture of covering over to print his announcement onto. So, I first understood this idea of isomorphism. I think I said in the beginning that it, it will take the whole lecture to successfully introduce this, and even then in quite an elementary way. But uh, I first read that word in relation to design in this book, What is a Designer? by Norman Potter. I said I trained as an artist, and this book, which I heard about in Dot 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 magazine in the early 2000s, is one of the things that really made me be interested in design. So Potter was a uh, designer and maker first. The picture in the top shows him with his workshop partner. They kind of comically ran a modernist design workshop in provincial England in the 1950s. He was a writer. He published this and one other book, um, writing about design, designed artefacts. Uh, he also wrote poetry, which, which I'll show to you shortly. And he was a teacher. In This is a view of um, the Construction School, which was a school that he founded with a group of teachers from the RCA in London in 1964. Just briefly to define the context of that, in the early 60s, lots of provincial design schools in England had their, uh, there was a, a national review and they had their um, credentials to make uh, 
to offer accredited courses removed and they all had to reconstitute themselves and reapply for a, um, a license and Bristol was one of the courses that failed so Norman Potter had this rather extraordinary situation, an opportunity to completely redefine a design school. But the thing that really made me, makes me excited about him is his work as a designer. This is a kitchen that he made for a house in London in 1961. And the video is uh, a rough film made by his daughter. She's a filmmaker, Sally Potter. Um, much later in its life, so it's being removed from uh, a house that it, it uh, was reassembled in some years after the original was dismantled. But the way she's filming it is actually strangely appropriate. The camera's making these moves because she wants to, the, the film to be somehow instructional for her or whoever it's going to be that will reassemble this kitchen. But it's actually completely consistent with how Potter himself defined the, the premise of this kitchen, which is maybe his most important idea about design. It's quite a Catholic idea that design should have no back. There shouldn't be a uh, aspect of this kitchen that conceals itself from you. So it was designed to be used in the round. You could circulate the um, kitchen. And I, t to me, this idea is, is quite quite dark, but also quite wonderful. I think he meant it in in a way to define some idea of truth kind of truth in decision making as a designer, where you prohibit yourself from um, hiding unresolved or awkward aspects of a work. You try to see it as God would see it from every perspective at once. So isomorphism in Potter's work is normally determined in relation to a machine, in this case the typewriter. Uh, I told you he wrote poems. He also, uh, in the mid-70s, staged a play in the form of a poetry reading with this very highly designed stage. On the left is a, is a plan view of the stage made on the typewriter, so using the, the matrix, the grid of the, the typewriter. And on the right is a uh, model of how the stage itself would be built. So it's supposed to resemble the typewriter from a um, elevated view. It's that typewriter, the Olivetti Lexicon 80. The format is, follows the idea of a trial. So the audience sit on the keys. The, um, the paper that's going into the typewriter is a projection screen. And various witnesses, the title of the play is Inquest of Icarus. And the witnesses are witnesses to the death of Icarus in the Greek myth. So they each come to speak at the at the centre of the stage, and there's a light bulb, an extremely powerful bulb that represents the sun, um, descends into the set from above. This diagram is um, exemplifying what Potter understood an isomorph to be. So in the notes for the performance he wrote this, the reinforcement that occurs in performance is isomorphic with the structure, content and general intention of the work in written form, with added reference to its origins as a physical act by handwriting and typewriter. It should follow, and does, that isomorphism is a theme of the work. And then he has this 
definition, similarity in unrelated forms, similarity in crystalline forms combined with similar chemical construction from the Chambers Dictionary. Um, as Rebecca mentioned, normally this word is related to mathematics, not chemistry. And in that context, isomorphism is a very general concept that appears in several areas. The word derives from the Greek iso meaning equal and morphosis meaning to form or to shape. Informally, an isomorphism is a map that preserves sets and relations among elements. So Potter used the typewriter in what he thought was an isomorphic way to uh, present the text to be read in this play. They, uh, their typography doesn't really follow um, a typical uh, way of registering timing as a, as a poem can do. This poem on the left is, is uh, typeset in prose and the voice is speaking about the wall, defining the wall that surround the performers in the beginning of the performance. So Potter understood that. It's, it's the only piece of prose, the only solid paragraphs that appear in the entire text. So he understood that to be isomorphic with the idea of a wall. And then this is one of the final poems, Icarus's Fall, which has this kind of concrete form in which these three trails um, position the text. So these are meant to be like instructions to the reader. Uh, normally in poetry, you might, uh, the, the line endings might tell you the rhythm at which the words are to be spoken. But this is really meant to be a single visual proposition. It's like an image that tells you how it should be read. We made a, a restaging of this performance. This is now five years ago in the Stedelijk Museum in Amsterdam. But for me, I mean, Okay, I have to go back. This might go wrong. For me, when I saw this, uh, in, the, in this room in the museum, you can have a... There's a kind of little opening up in the, up in the um, mezzanine space, so you can actually have this view and look down on, on what's happening in the performance. And when I took this view, I reflected in a way on what a weak isomorph this is. Um, because looking at the way the scripts appear, there's this kind of feedback happening between the mechanism of the typewriter and the, the voices of the performers that will speak those words. But here, all of the all of the processes that have actually constructed this space really have nothing to do with that. It's just become like an icon. So it's a, it represents the typewriter, but it has <coughs> none of the typewriter's internal logic. So, and the way that I'm pursuing this research that I'm making into Norman Potter's work is somewhat out of fear. He was, his writing was, is very forceful. He's quite a judgmental character in his writing and actually in his um, approach to teaching. So for me it feels almost impossible to write any kind of academic sentence about Norman Potter. It feels very difficult to say, Norman Potter thought X. Or, I, I feel I have no access and no right to assume a voice that takes any perspective from, from inside him. And for that reason, the, the, the way that I'm um, following the research is to try to be in the presence of whatever 
artifact that I can find that, that might be made to represent him. This is a house in uh, the Charente region of central France. Uh, the picture was taken in 2014. It's a house that used to be owned by Potter from the mid-80s, uh, coincident with Margaret Thatcher. He left England and um, lived in a, a series of houses in France, which he was in the process of renovating. Um, I visited this place in 2015 uh, looking for one of these artefacts that I could use to uh, write about him and found this, his lexicon 80. And uh, to me, it became then possible to, to uh, try to have this become an isomorphic instrument in a, in a new context. So it's been, it, at the time I was there, it had been there, he died in 95, so it had been there for 19 years. and it was completely rusted, so there was no possibility to type with this thing. Um, but this series of images that represent that kind of paralysis of this machine, in particular the letter U, which was used in this um, isomorphic way in the script, became a way, a metaphor, to write about him as a neglected figure. So the idea is that uh, it becomes isomorphic in a different register, which um, I hope, I think, is consistent with the, um, the mechanism of that machine in the condition that I found it. Now I think I should attempt some kind of typology of isomorphs, how they might relate to graphic design. As well as my map of Australia, I also offer this. This is the, somehow like the most succinct example of, of what an isomorph could be that I've found. So it's, it, maybe it's clear, but what's happening there is the uh, frequency of the rotation of the helicopter blades matches the shutter speed of the camera, so you don't perceive the movement of the blades. It's quite mechanical in, in its isomorphism, but because it's coming from the camera because it has this, because it's essentially a representation of this situation, this scene. What it produces that I find really exciting is, is the strangeness of this helicopter taking off with its rotors not moving, where rotation of those rotors is the essential thing that enables that take off that flight. So the strangeness produced by that asks you the question, how is that possible? And the, um, the answer or the response to that is somehow um, on this axis of what's the most important thing about this phenomenon. So in failing to represent the rotation, the camera actually draws your attention to what is the most mechanically significant thing happening in this image. So I'm calling that a mechanical isomorph. This is a piece of my work from this summer. It's a monograph for the artist Sophia Halton. 
it was going to be part of the talk for me to explain why this typography was used on the cover using uh, my pencil to draw on the screen, but it doesn't work for some reason. I think it would just be excessively confusing to attempt it without that, so I continue. Um, this is this is quite a straightforward monograph in a way. It features um, photographs of works by Sophia. She makes sculptures and video normally. Uh, they're arranged, though, according to uh, particular uh, characteristics of them as objects. So these two works are not chronologically related, but they both uh, uh, use production processes related to moulding. The work on the left is a rock which is um, cast in latex, then ground down to dust and then moulded into its own form again. So it, its uh, texture is somehow homogenised but it is essentially um, consistent with itself as an object. And on the right, a work in found um, MDF made using the same process and then their arrangement on the page trying to be suggestive of this idea of a, a mould and what it contains. Then a series of new sculptures that uh, follow the work of a Russian computer scientist, Mikhail Bongard. These are machine learning problems from the mid-60s. Um, they're called Bongard problems. I'll just read a description of what they are. The idea of a Bongard problem is to present two sets of relatively simple diagrams, say A and B. All the diagrams from set A have a common factor or attribute which is lacking in all the diagrams of set B. The problem is to find or to formulate convincingly the common factor in such terms that a computer can assimilate. So essentially this is quite an early attempt at um, machine learning, visually teaching the computer di to distinguish things by trying to solve the human problem of how to actually define what the difference between the, the um, images is. So Sophia made a series of sculptures following some of those logics and they're placed in the book always as these full bleed double spreads but they only appear in what in English we call the true spreads. So this book is uh, bound in sections of 16 pages. Uh, they are then gathered together and stitched. In the middle of each of those sets of 16, there's one opening that is really truly a continuous sheet of paper. All the others combine um, uh, pages actually printed on separate leaves. So the, we placed all of these Bongard problem sculptures always on the true spreads of the book. And th this says something about what I think might be another important aspect of the isomorph in graphic design and, and something that distinguishes it from metaphors or visual metaphors is that it doesn't necessarily have to have a communicative intent. So in this sense, once the book is actually bound, unless you're a graphic designer or a bookbinder, you would not inspect that object and ever know that these works were placed for that reason. But in the dialogue between myself and the artist, that decision-making process has a kind of gravity. You know, it's a, there's a reason to make that choice, which we then feel convinced by and work proceed to work around. Um, now, the most important aspect of the book is actually its binding. 
I need to show you some of Sophia's work for it to make sense. This video is called Not Sequences. It's from 2014. So 
it's obvious what's happening. There's a there's a causal series of events. You uh, you're in a studio. You pick up an apple, but you drop it in the dirt. So you clean it on your trousers, take a bite, eat the apple, put it in the bin. Um, in this work, there are all these kind of parallel streams in which those that sequence of events is scrambled. I think it's the way that work is realised. It's really important that what you see is not a misfunctioning of anything. So the in terms of the, how how it's shot and how it's edited, it's actually very precisely done. So the disturbance that you see when you watch it is this rather kind of nihilistic idea of how the world appears to us when our automated perceptions of how it is are um, disrupted. This is the cover for the book that we made. The the significant aspect of it is this, this binding. This is called, in English, stab stitching. Uh, these metal staples are pressed at very high pressure through the entire book block. Um, but in this case, the book is actually bound after it's already been shrink-wrapped. So you have this almost imperceptible detail when you when you handle this thing as an object, but that is consistent with one of the main propositions of the artist, which is a uh, disruption of a causal series of events. It's entirely possible that you would open this book without ever noticing that detail, but in that case, what always happens is a bit of the wrapping snags on the staple, so you have this slight strangeness that can draw your attention to it. So to me that strangeness is consistent with the strangeness of the helicopter blades not rotating, in that it's strange in the same register, in the most important register to understand the artist's work. So I'm calling that a procedural isomorph. This is a book that was designed by uh, Laurent Bennett, Swiss designer. Um, it's the catalogue of the most beautiful Swiss books in 2004. If you don't know, this, this is a, an annual um, award given to a selection of the most beautiful books made in Switzerland in that year. And the uh, job of designing that book is always given to or at this time was given to one designer for three consecutive years. So you would have three chances to do a catalogue. And what emerged from that dynamic is a kind of uh, invention competition amongst the people designing the catalogue to um, make it as spectacular or then boring or then, uh, you know, to kind of... Um, um, sort of compete with each other over time. And then this happened, which is kind of the, the, the winning uh, way to do this. Um, what the book is, is he contacted the designers and printers of all the winning books and ask them to reproduce using the same materials and processes and conditions one section from the binding of that, of that winning book. So he had then, I don't know the number of books, I want to say 50, but maybe that's wrong. Then he had 50 uh, sections of books all made uh, in the exact original conditions that they were made and then he bound them together to make this kind of monstrous book where nothing really fits together. He added these captions to identify the books at the right edge.
to me, if anything would ever convince me and you know, somehow refresh my uh, faith in graphic design, it's this book. I just find it to be um, such an economical gesture. So, so I'm, I'm saying that the book, when you handle it, has this kind of strangeness. And again, that seems isomorphic to me because the thing that it reveals is actually the community of um, book production in Switzerland. So his work as the designer was just to be in contact with the people at each of these design studios, bookbinders, printers. So, so I, I think that that might be a relational isomorph. Something of mine also from early this year, but worked on painfully for many years, uh, a monograph of Celine Condorelli's work. Um, this is a really big book, so I, I just show you some views of the pages to give a general idea of it. It again uses uh, some of the same devices that were in Sophia Hulton's book. So there's a kind of uh, rhetoric of the placement or uh, quality of the reproductions of the works. In this case, a series of um, extremely ephemeral uh, curtains installed in galleries and made using this uh, space blanket material that you um, that is used as kind of emergency blankets. Uh, reproductions of these pictures done in five colours, so cyan, magenta, yellow and black, and then a gold ink that just appears in the curtain. The, um, that method of reproduction requires a, a separate module of the printing press to print gold. If you would just give it solid gold, you would get a very kind of um, turgid or dull reproduction. So what I did was I took the essential visual characteristic of these <coughs> curtains is that they um, shimmer as people move around them in the space. So I took the other four, the cyan, magenta, yellow and black channels. I uh, adjusted the contrast in them so that you only saw the shadows. And then I, I combined those into one channel which became the gold channel. So you, you just have these, um, it's a slightly off registration but um, with the idea of taking that, those little fragments of movement that are characteristic of the work. <coughs> and then the aspect of this book that I think might be isomorphic is this. It's a series of works made in the Pirelli tyre factory in Italy. Um, Celine was able to, th this is a one-to-one a, a -one scale reproduction of a tyre where the, um, what you see underneath is documentation of a process an intervention in that tyre's production that Celine made in the factory. So she is uh, encountering different parts of the tyre workflow and um, negotiating, having conversations with the people that work in the factory. And ultimately she made, she manipulated part of the um, mechanism to produce this artwork in the form of a uh, tyre. But, or and, the, the significant aspect of that work is about the blackness of carbon rubber. Um, so the whole logic, the conceptual logic of the work is about what you could call elementary colour. A colour that, however much you zoom in on it, 
is um, essentially black, you know, kind of purely black. So there's a section in the book that reproduces these um, various fragments of, of research into um, rubber and tyre making processes. This one is the significant one because it comes at the end of a section of CMYK, cyan, magenta, yellow and black printing. And the image that you see um, on the right is the beginning of a section of two colour printing. These images show the production of this book. This was done at Artiginelli in uh, Brescia in Italy. And this man is, was mixing and applying, matching a, a single ink, a single red ink that would exactly visually correspond to the appearance of red in this image on the left. And in that image, the red is actually 100% magenta, 100% yellow. So it's not a pure colour. And he's mixing a pure colour to recreate that colour. So on that single opening, if you zoom into the tyre on the left, it looks like this, comprised of a matrix of uh, droplets of cyan, magenta, yellow and black ink. And if you zoom into the tyre on the right, it looks like this, only black and red. This is an another uh, production detail that is completely invisible to anyone except graphic designers or printers, but um, allows in the design process a, a kind of certainty about something. So if the important aspect of this work is elementary colour, these reproductions follow through that logic. And then that, that defines red and black as the two colours that will appear in the following sections of the binding. And that, that there are various design decisions that follow from that choice. Okay, uh, the last couple of things to show. This might be familiar, this is, I'm sure, in the collection of the ZKM. It's a video by Dennis Oppenheim called Two Stage Transfer from 1971. It's made by the artist and his son, Eric. He wrote about it, as I run a marker along Eric's back, he attempts to duplicate the movement on the wall. My activity stimulates a kinetic response from his sensory system. I am therefore drawing through him. Because Eric is my offspring and we share similar biological ingredients, his back as surface can be seen as an immature version of my own. In a sense, I make contact with a past state. That's an extract. The, the work is, I think, uh, 15 minutes. I forgot to define Celine's, the, the, the red and black images. I'm calling them material isomorphs. Uh, and this, this kind of bodily feedback, this gesture mediated through a body, um, I'm using to frame this book, uh, designed for Gavin Wade, who's one of the other Eastside Projects directors, uh, as a compilation of his writing. And the typography in this book 
is in a way trying to do something with voice, as in the, the spoken voice that is um, somehow in relation to that Oppenheim video. The typography follows this. This is a, an extract of a text by Herbert Beyer. I think this is from 1930-something. And it's a typographic proposition called square span. Tradition requires that sentences follow each other in a horizontal continuous sequence. Paragraphs are used to ease perception by a slight break. There is no reason for this to be the only method to transmit language to the eye. Sentences could, could as well follow each other vertically or otherwise if it would facilitate reading. Following is an excerpt of a letter from the reporter of direct mail advertising. Squarespan is putting words into thought groups of two or three short lines, such as, after a short time, you will begin thinking in easily understood groups of words. You will automatically stop confusing your sentences with complicated phrases and unnecessary words. Typewriters and typesetting machines would have to be adjusted to this method. Text written in logical, short, thought groups lends itself best. That sentence um, about the kind of writing that gives itself to this kind of typography is the basis for um, using this typography in a book of Gavin's writing. I'll show you some of the writing in a moment. There's also this. Uh, this is from 75, Stefan Themison's Biomus. Uh, it's a novel written using what he called semantic typography, which is a, in a way a much more imaginative but not unrelated idea about how words might perform their relation or perform their meaning on the page. This is a really good example of... Um, crystal structures that are where the words are arranged in crystalline forms or superficially crystalline forms. But Gavin's writing is always, whenever I read it, I hear him. He performs his writing a lot, always in this very kind of punchy and sort of provocative voice. So... I proposed to him that we render his text in square span. The um, extract from Herbert Beyer's book that I showed you, I had in the margins of my InDesign document as I worked on this, trying to follow the logic of um, thought groups, defining what is a thought group in a sentence. So I show you just one essay, the text goes in and out of square span. So whenever it feels like the voice is shifting into that voice that belongs in square span, the typography changes. Some people believe painting is an illusion of reality. That painting is not what is not painting. The hoax of painting is an act of replication. They are wrong. They are missing the point of painting. It's quite a bad impression, but you understand the uh, you know how you might arrive at this idea. So I thought I would just offer something quite short and speculative to end. Um, to me, what's interesting about identifying this idea of isomorphism as it might relate to graphic design is um, trying to become more conscious of what kind of instrument you are as a designer. Um, 
I really felt this very strongly this summer working on the book of Sophia Halton's work that this language was already in my thoughts and it really conditioned the approach that I took to making that book. So in that spirit, I start to think about what kinds of material could be best represented isomorphically. This is a picture in the laboratory of Carl Dyseroff at Stanford University. I visited this laboratory in April of this year. What you see on the chart is a, um, a simple representation of clarity. Clarity is a process um, designed by this laboratory. The point of the process is to take a mouse brain, uh, apply a series of chemical uh, treatments to that brain, which ultimately render it transparent. So the purpose of the research is to create tools that other scientists can use in their study of the brain. Um, this is of course the, the most um, explicit idea about what it might mean to visualize a brain, to make it transparent. Um, but actually, historically, neuroscience, the science of the brain, has always been a visual science. These are drawings from the 1870s by Santiago Ramon y Cajal. Um, they were enabled by um, an Italian scientist, Camillo Golgi, who developed this method for staining neurons. So he worked on sections of um, uh, brains of dead animals. An animal brain as a human brain um, gives you nothing visually. It's just grey matter. And if you slice it, it has a kind of internally consistent texture. So the idea of there being a visual uh, way to understand the functioning of the brain uh, requires chemical interventions. So he developed this, this process to stain black neurons uh, using particular proteins that some neurons would uh, respond to. What's quite extraordinary about that is this image is from 2008. It's part of Nobel Prize winning work called the Brainbow, uh, done at Jeffrey Lichtman's laboratory at Harvard. This is an entirely more sophisticated procedure that produces this image, but it essentially is conceptually the same idea as Golgi had over a hundred years before. Um, these are neural connections in the brain. The way the image is produced is uh, one of the team of scientists whose work this is saw a particular kind of jellyfish that has a transparent flesh. Uh, and he postulated that there may be something biologically about the matter of that creature that might enable uh, a visual process in the brain. So he uh, extracted protein from this jellyfish. Um, he developed a genetically modified mouse who, uh, whose brain was uh, uh, contained some of this protein or some of this protein was administered to this animal's brain. Using different kinds of jellyfish he was able to make mouse brains that were sensitive to different colours of protein. He would then breed those mice to arrive at a mouse sensitive to multiple colours. And then this image is produced showing uh, the connections of different groups of neurons in the brain. So it's an extremely sophisticated process, but in terms of how this image registers as a piece of design thinking, it's actually incredibly 
retarded in a way, simplistic, because what it visualises really has no meaning, no scientific insight is produced by this. All that is understood is that there are groups of connected neurons, the colours themselves have no meaning and the scientists don't understand what the connections represent, they just understand that these groups of neurons are related. To me it's, if you see uh, scientific papers of this work, they obviously uh, focus on this particular visual language, but it's quite extraordinary to think of the whole effort, which you could maybe sum up by saying, we grind up jellyfish to uh, visualise the brains of mice. This is an image of a perceptron. Um, the image on the left I got from Matteo Pasconelli's recent paper about this, and that's an image of the machine itself, uh, designed by Frank Rosenblatt in 1960. I think that artificial intelligence, or uh, coming at the problem of intelligence from this uh, analog mechanical direction. So if you understand those images of biological manipulations of a, of a, a real brain to be in some way producing some visual insight but incredibly primitively, it may be that to understand the function of the brain this kind of isomorphic uh, procedure might be more productive. So the idea of simulating or modelling a brain to reveal something about it in representation is the final idea of this talk. Morphism related to graphic design. Yes. Um, because I feel like it's probably something that is useful. Um, I it really struck me that oh well, your presentation really kind of confirmed my suspicion that you're a radically responsive designer. And I mean radically in a, in a, in its commitment to precision, a high degree of nerdiness. Mm -hmm. <laughs> But also um, a really thorough understanding of the, art, the artist practice, let's say. I mean, you're working for in other contexts as well, but the examples that were sort of most illustrative were the ones with the staple or what you did with Celine Condorelli's book. Yeah. I wonder, um, okay, so that's kind of my reading of it. You can feel free to respond to it. Um, I guess. So something that I would want to follow up with playing there was advocate is isn't that just kind of um, like where where is it an internal sort of system of justification for your decisions mm -hmm. or when when does it become something that articulates itself to the outside or, be, or becomes a tool for others to use mm -hmm. like how much of it is a personal sort of system I mean designers are always I guess guilty of kind of wanting to or feeling the need to um, defend mm. our decisions, so mm. I'm kind of curious how you, you s respond to this. Yeah, yeah, so I think that it's, there is this really important question there that's about the communicative intent of any of those examples, and I think in a way that that, that way of decision making is really motivated by those close collaboration, so it's really enabled by that. And it's a question of getting the confidence of your collaborator to allow their work to be represented that way. Um, 
which to me is obviously in a way just about an internal decision making dynamic but I think that it what it always produces in my experience is a kind of energy around the artist realization that there are these graphic possibilities you know this is a really old idea about um, how graphic design could is essentially a, a, a representative medium but it, but um, there was this whole moment of artist publishing in the 70s that really began to define things made graphically in books also as works in themselves so I, I feel like I'm ex always trying to exploit that territory but um, always in negotiation and cooperation with someone so so that's it's about getting the confidence of that person and I, I feel like it's quite ephemeral but it does affect the outcome because you get things produced I remember when I when I was um, first getting interested in design I read this thing an interview with graphic thought facility who had some designers that I really liked in London and they said that their entire aesthetic was just about resisting A4 CMYK and I think that actually people are surprisingly sensitive obviously of course in the area of artist books to um, things that have that kind of strangeness that I was talking about so I, I use that word because I think that it sends a kind of signal that there's something weird about the thing and that that weirdness if it resonates with you does have a communicative possibility but maybe just another thing to say is that um, in that all this is drawn from Norman Potter who's actually quite a patriarchal character I think that there is I do feel myself a kind of doubtfulness about the idea of being so deterministic in decision making you know making things that have this truth that is a negotiated truth that, that I try to find a consensus on but that essentially like the mental model of it as a representation is quite definitive and that's it, it, it's interesting to me that's why I showed Laurent's book is that I think it's interesting to to have that happen in a way that isn't like a shutting down of something but is you know produces a as full a representation of something as possible okay I, I can go on but I think it's also good for others to ask questions I expect at least three questions from graphic design students mm. or guest teachers <laughs> Sorry. Tim, I certainly enjoyed your talk. It was great, um, even though I got a bit lost in the mouse brain section. Um, <laughs> I, had to, um, it, it's a, I had to think of, of this, um, of the purse triad of symbols. Um, I don't, don't know how much familiar it is. It's very simple. This is the iconic sign, the arbitrary sign, and the indexical sign. Hmm. Um, and for some, it's more a question if, if this makes sense to you. You, you know this, this thing, but, well, it's, it's the arbitrary sign is that anything can mean anything, if you tell us to mean that. Oh, yeah. um, and the iconic, it resembles somehow the, the object. Yeah. And the indexical sign is the most interesting, and this is what I, um, what I kind of see in, 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 in what you're trying to talk. That's the question, actually. The indexical is if you walk along the beach, and then your foot leaves a print. So that's the sign that you have been there. It's this sort of the difference you're trying to, or you are after, that's the, the real, that's, there's a sort of a structural analogy, but the thing reproduces itself. It's not shown, but it's there. Yeah, uh, yeah, so the, that's what attracted me to that, the image that I started with of the uh, silhouette, the outline of Australia, and the idea that any of, anything that I showed is you know, possibly arbitrary and um, relative 
meaning that it would be possible to articulate this lecture talking about completely different aspects of those books and telling you that they're isomorphic. But in that image of Australia, I find that quite captivating because it doesn't contain any, there's nothing about intention or really uh, authorship of that aspect of that image. It's just completely coincidental. And I use the word fractal because I, that's what I think happens when you look at that and read that sentence that this t tourist has travelled around all of Australia <coughs> found herself on this beach in Darwin and made this picture that visualises all of Australia that's that's again at that point of is it shutting something down or is it opening something up I feel like I've been distracted from your question already <laughs> Hi James. Hi. Um, I just wondered if you could explain the principle of square span a bit more because I, I think you all, um, also used it for a couple of other books than the one you showed, for example the Gertrude Stein adaptation from Ute Eisenreich. Yes. A play for example. And I just wondered how or if like the principle of language or the game on words becomes or turns into a game of the eye or a visual game and how like language and the word itself is connected in this certain, very certain specific principle for you. Yeah. <laughs> what an observe, uh, observant audience. Thank you, Tatiana. So, so maybe I show this, these couple of pictures. Of my notes. <clears throat> yeah, so this this thing, the book that you talked about, I sort of <coughs> understood that as a kind of warm up for square span. So in Gertrude Stein's poetry, there are always these. It, it almost like has to be channeled by your mouth. So, you, so there are these kind of rhythms and repetitions that that get stranger and that you stumble on as you deliver them. Um, which was the first time that I I felt like that was language that could be treated this way. Um, obviously, in th th there's. In a way, a, a different kind of tension in this because she's not living to negotiate that idea with. So it becomes absolutely a more deterministic gesture. You know, it's, it really is a transformative design decision that can't be negotiated. But but for me, was made because of producing this slightly off visualization of the rhythm of those sentences. So this thing about 10 pages and what are their ages is almost like a visual joke on how hard it is to say that right. By, by putting them, they're, they're almost out off the rhythm that they should be in. And then What seemed possible with this, because Gavin is someone that I've worked really closely with, there were two or three things that I knew would convince him of, the, of, the, of this. One of them is I know that he loves Herbert Beyer and he loves to uh, reuse or remake artists' work without their permission. It, like that, that appeals to his sense of humour. Uh, 
And then as I talked a little bit about the way that he writes, the way that he manages to embed his personality into language on a page, made me think that we would be able to make choices that would feel internally consistent to him according to this rule. So I said that I kept it in the margin because it's, it's really tempting. So you might look at the pages and think that they're kind of done artfully, but they're actually, they're quite sincerely trying to stick to the logic of a thought group of two or three words. Um, so this is quite different than the Gertrude Stein because it's, uh, it's trying to be in rhythm with the meaning. So that means that the visual appearance produces groups of words that belong together and that when your eyes surveys them, you, you can take them, you can take the thought group as a unit. So it's like the same stylistic visual principle for different kind of users. I yeah, think. yeah, but I think that's actually quite important because there's something about uh, novelty that is uncomfortable to me, meaning that we have millions and millions of books with the orthography of sentences and paragraphs, and for that reason nobody ever questions their formal relationship to the text or to the format of the book. So to me, what Herbert Bayer was proposing, and you could see that in the, the rhetoric of his little text, is that this is an alternative. He meant all the typewriters and typesetting machines to be modified. You know, it's such a modernist idea. But to me, the the you have to use that idea. I don't like the idea that it, is a, it can only be used for one thing and then it's like a, a ruin. I, I like the idea of exploring the, the different ways to inhabit that proposition. Have you ever isomorphically had to decline the format of the book? Like. Be for, for an artist, let's say, like a catalogue, was there ever a moment where isomorphically you couldn't do it, it had to be a different format? Uh, not really, because I, I did this project about Ulysses Carrion, who was this uh, Mexican uh, publisher of artist books, who had this shop, the first shop for artist books in the world, in Amsterdam, in the mid-70s, and there was this bit of text that he wrote about the format of the book. And he wrote this line, a novel by a, by a writer of genius or a mediocre writer is a book where nothing happens. And I understood that to mean um, pages of uh, It's a bit ironic to say this while showing this Squarespan thing, but pages of books where you have a where you have continuous prose in paragraphs is ignoring the essential sculptural characteristics of a book, where a book is a sequence of spaces or openings. And that sequence does not, according to him, imply continuity. They're, they're just discrete spaces that appear in their own rhythm. Uh, so, so reading that, understanding that, has always sort of conditioned me to think about books in that way, where you, you have to position, place things in a way that inhabits that format somehow. What I'm, the answer to the question is that is I have this like previous assumption that I, I almost like never challenge. So to me it's like the idea of, of, of um, 
formats out of, of changing the format in a publishing context like artist monographs is kind of missing the point or avoiding the question of how to translate the content via the format. I, I get it. I know. I, feel, I do feel tempted to ask something about Camillo Golgi's staining method and the mouse brain, but I won't, I, just, I won't ask that. I have a very simple question. When you showed the close-up of the Olivetti typewriter, yes. and you had the keyboard and then the U, uh, because I thought you might expand a little more on the strange relationship or non-relationship between the typewriter, the keyboard, and the letters produced, because you have a sans-serif U on it, but the letters produced are with serif, aren't they? So it's, it's non-isomorphic. And was that something you wanted to show? Or uh, perhaps, was it like, no, sort of. <coughs> because it would be interesting to see that there are machines that have keyboards and they don't produce what they pretend to produce. Yeah. Which yeah. would be a very interesting project to, you know, irritate people on. Yeah. It was <laughs> yeah, it's a good observation. I mean, all the Apple keyboard, the Apple keyboards changed recently from, I think it's Myriad to San Francisco, which is Apple's proprietary typeface. So maybe they mean that isomorphically in the sense that I, everyone ideally would type consistent with the identity of the computer. Um, but instead, for me, the thing to emphasize about this is that in the script, the U is meant isomorphically as in you. So the reason why we made the photograph of that key is to enable us to, to talk about that aspect of it. But I've never even thought of what you said, so I will think about that. Thanks for your talk. You told a lot about uh, little things to bring kind of the truth or uh, an aspect from what you saw in the book, for example. And uh, I was wondering if you design a book, as a designer you have to make so much decisions from choosing the format to the type setting to the typeface to the paper to the printing, to the color, like you're in more or less in charge of everything what the book says in the end, in terms of feeling the book, reading the book, understanding the book, and uh, I was wondering how you challenged it, that you have so much steps to do, and actually you, uh, I imagine it's quite hard to put in every little detail the truth or to explain where it comes from and how do you decide what you decide by the content? Hmm. If that question makes sense. Yeah, I think so. In, in, the, in the first part of the question I was thinking to respond by talking about um, a kind of intimate familiarity with that whole process, you know, from the conversations that you have when you're first approached to design something to the, the technical reality of making that thing according to the possibilities in a particular situation. Um, and I think Actually, that's kind of why I showed some boring books in the beginning, is to, is to kind of imply that idea of having done those things and doing them, making you more sensitive to the possibilities of subverting things about that workflow, where it's, it's so much defined by being optimised you know, in the software, um, how 
Adobe encourages you to have things line up with each other against your will. Uh, and how in the workflow in a printer, for example, to make this thing where the books are shrink-wrapped and then stapled is just highly annoying, you know, from every, every as, soon as, as soon as that email was received, you know, you can picture the guy's face, he's like, so I, I feel like that's, that's all just like embedded knowledge of how those processes work and therefore what the opportunities are to adjust them, but where that possibility of adjusting them is kind of dependent on lots of human factors, like how well you know in design, how, how confident you are that the, the guy who rolls his eyes when he gets your email can ultimately be convinced to do that thing. Um, but I, th I think in the second part of your question, you, you were just kind of confirming to me that, they're, they're, that I should be doubtful about the, the more self-aware and the more defined this idea of isomorphism is. Like in that particular book of Sophia Hulton's, you start to look for those opportunities ahead of other opportunities. So. I'm describing that work to you in the context of saying, look how resonant or relative it is to a, a defining logic in her work. But I'm just saying those words to convince you that I was right to do that that way. And there are also other consequences of that decision, like the fact that that book doesn't open and lie flat. So. That's why I showed scans instead of photographs. And mitigating that, it, it's absolutely true that in the conversations I had with the artist before, I deliberately spent lots of time talking about the, the conceptual consistency of that decision and zero time talking about how the book won't open nicely because, because of that desire to to work in that way. So it is, that's an answer, isn't it? You, you know, that there's a, there's a kind of, there are, there are other forces, you know, that, that you try to handle appropriately. Thank you. Uh, hey, I have a question regarding like kind of the, the last sentence you just said. Um, that the book you were talking about won't open nicely because of um, this staple binning. Um, you also talked about the true spreads, which are like you kind of choose this kind of binning. Well, it was in, invented by book binners to have books which are really lying down on the table when you open them. So this is kind of, um, and you even made like um, this, this, this concept that um, those pages are even more important in the book, but by choosing that kind of binning, they are get, you kind of hide those pages and they get like totally equal to the rest. Um, even, even more than it would have been if you would take like a usual binning, right? Um, yeah. <laughs> so it's like by doing this, no one beside you and maybe the artist and the book binder knows about it. I mean, you 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 talked about that, but you could have le left like kind of a hint for people who, who kind of know about it to see it. But by 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 staple everything like that, you kind of you hide it completely. Is this like kind of um, what, I mean, of course it was kind of on purpose, but is it like, um, I don't know, I, I have the feeling like both ideas are, are of course super good and a super nice transfer, but they kind of, kind of, um, yeah, erase each other in a way, you know? 
Um, was it like, did you ever thought about that, or was it like more that it just fit that good? Yeah, yeah I think I think it's really good, critical question, because it's um, like I was just saying before. It's absolutely true that the the that there's this one decision that's the defining decision, and and it uh, affects every other aspect of the. Not really the book design, but the, the book's production, the way that it's experienced by somebody. And the actual kind of truth of, of the reality that, that you're asking about is that all of those, um, what I called rhetorics of the placement of works in the book, so the way the two moulded works were positioned in a way that they could receive each other when the book is closed, or the true spreads thing, were made before the, um, before one particular technical reality was understood about the implications of this staple binding. And it's that we originally wanted to have this book made on a lighter paper for this reason that the, the, the flexibility of the paper right at the point where it's held tightest by the binding would be more forgiving. It would open nicer and possibly reveal this um, the significance of the placement of those pictures that you talked about. But the machine that makes the stab binding cannot accept paper lighter than this, this certain weight that's the weight that we ultimately used. But at that moment there was, because this kind of decision making that I'm talking about is a defining one, meaning that lots of other aspects of the book, in particularly the cover design, followed from that decision to have this binding, meaning that maybe if we if we felt that the cover wasn't already making this very particular proposition, we would maybe have chosen a cover image, for example, the book might have looked completely different. But that reality only became known to me at this point where I just felt like I can't change that. So ideally, that, that one technical aspect that you noticed should be different. So that's, I think that's a really good question, especially from someone who hasn't even handled this book. Uh, yeah, so that, that criticism is right. That is absolutely a kind of um, weakness of that book. But I guess since um, what I understood from Bela's question and your answer, it's not about all the decisions being isomorphic, but that there are some kind of key responses of strangeness. Yeah. Is that it also means that that creates a hierarchical order of importance and, and yeah, priority. Yeah. It's not something that is it's a principle that is applied on a kind of flat in a, in a horizontal, but more on a, like a vertical. Yes, yeah, it's true. It's, yeah, it's also interesting for me to reflect on the fact that I have never said this word isomorph to any artist that I've worked with, yeah. because I feel like it's. It, it shouldn't be the, the kind of dominant thing about it. So I wouldn't want anyone to feel like they have to s submit to this design idea that, that will then be used in a context like this to say that that is the important part of that artifact. Um, yeah, so I feel like that's, that's also a bit unresolved. Which I think is a really strong part about it. Yeah. I don't really want to have the last word, but maybe I'm not sure whether we're done with questions. Is there anyone left? Do you want to just say something? <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise, I just thank you very much and thank you, thank you guys for your concentration and this amazing Q and A. I really learned a lot about your practice and you guys from this round. Yeah, really good question. Thank you. Have a good evening.